Hello. <laughs> John, thank you so much for coming. Well, as Eleanor said, you've been our um, companion over our breakfast tables. Now we only see you on Mastermind. Only. Only. Oh, well, okay, but tell me about Mastermind. Um, well, Mastermind is quite simply the best thing that's ever happened to me. I, I, I've been a journalist for 108 years, and um, most of that time asking questions of politicians on the Today program. Then I find myself doing Mastermind and discover that there are people out there who actually want to answer your questions. <laughs> It, it was a, a revealing experience. I admit it, having said that, um, you, you do get some bizarre answers. Am I allowed to do the mastermind bit for about a minute? I think it's a really good think? idea. Are you going to try us out on a question? I will, I will, I'm going to do that, yeah. Good. All right. if, if that's all we right. all love quizzes. We all love quizzes, yeah, all right. Well, the uh, thing is, we, we have at um, Christmas and the New Year this thing called Celebrity Mastermind. You may have... You may have watched it. It's fair to say, I think, that by and large, um, those who appear on the program do so rather more for their um, celebrity than their master minds. As it, the general knowledge is definitely it, easier. It, it, precisely. You've spotted that. Anyway, so, so, so I'm going to just test you. To, soap opera star, first question for him was the following. You're required to shout out the answer. Right? Go on. What breakfast cereal do you associate with prison? His answer, Cheerios. <laughs> <laughs> and and that's, that's a cheap and easy one. But I'm going to just do terribly, terribly quick ones, all right? Um, so are we allowed to know who all these people were? Uh, but just be patient, okay, Rosie. Right, just, right. just, just be patient. I said he was yeah. a soap opera star, yeah. Okay. And I did wonder whether he was being brilliantly ironic or just thick. He was just thick. Anyway, <laughs> all right, a politician coming up. Three, three very mo slightly more difficult questions, all right? Um, who succeeded? Henry VIII. Edward VI, yes, Edward VI. Not Henry VII. <laughs> <laughs> what, was, what was the name of the prison they stormed in Paris in 1789? Mm -hmm, not Versailles. <laughs> and, what, and what was the name of the, uh, the person, the woman who uh, discovered radiation? I'll give you a clue. Her first name was Marie. Curie. Mm, and not Antoinette. <laughs> <laughs> His, his name, and I am not, honestly, I'm not making this, his name was, you will have heard of him, David Lammy. Mm -hmm. And he was at the time, at the time, he was Her Majesty's Minister of State for Higher Education. I rest my case. <laughs> so you, you, you wonder why I enjoy it, but that's, yeah. Okay, that's fantastic. Yeah. Anyway. Um, David Lammy's spoken here. Has he? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Did anybody? Um, and, and, and was that a great... Well, let's, carry move, on. let's move on. So, <laughs> <laughs> this book that you have there... Um, yeah. It's terrific. I've been reading it over the weekend, and it's hugely enjoyable, and I recommend it highly. But you, you started out with a stroppy nature to authority, didn't you? Um, and that came from your dad. Uh, that, that's, that's true. Um, yes, my father was a French policy. We were a working-class family, not very much money. Um, and uh, Well, no money, really. And he, um, he was, uh, when he was a little boy, when he was 13, he, he uh, got measles and... Uh, escaped from the house. He'd been confined to the house because, you know, mm -hmm. bright light can damage the optic nerve and all that kind of thing. Anyway, he escaped on a snowy day, a lot of snow and sunshine, and, and went blind. And as a result of that, had a pretty bloody miserable child, as you can imagine. Um, and and he, I think he was probably stroppy anyway, even before that happened, but he was extremely stroppy after that and, and found it difficult, obviously, to get work. But he did, in the end. He, he got an apprenticeship as French polisher, and uh, his high, eyesight gradually, but never, you know, just came back a bit enough to function. And, uh, and he lasted in his first job for one week. At the end of it, he punched the foreman on his nose, and that was it. Never, never, never got another job. Hated authority of all sorts, so what he did was he, 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 he polished kind of people's pianos and tables and things like that in, in the kitchen of our house while my mother was doing hairdressing in the kitchen as well. It was quite a, a household of smells, as I, as I recall, rather unpleasant smells. Um, uh, and um, he disliked authority to such an extent that if he went to one of the grand houses to do some French polishing and, and, and they, they suggested, the, the butler perhaps suggested he go to the servants' quarters, he wouldn't. <laughs> he was, went to his local club, you know, working man's club, and refused on a Friday night. It was 
packed. He would not sit under the portrait of the Queen, and there was only one chair, so they threw him out of the club. I mean, that was him. That was him, and I, I inherited, I, I fear that. We, we, I think we probably did talk, but mostly we just argued. Once I became a teenager, capable of arguing, and that was what we did. Yeah. But your, your dislike of authority kind of carried on through your school days, through it your did. first I, jobs. Didn't yes, you? I left school at 15. I didn't get on with the headmaster at all. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He, 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 he beat me because I was late one day because I was delivering papers and it was a snowy day and the papers were late and he and I never forget I think he was an arsehole actually they invited me to uh, when, I, when I got on telly and was a, a, a little bit well known um, they, they, they wrote to me and, and said would I do the prize day speech you know a speech on mm -hmm. the, uh, the prize giving day and, 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 um, and I wrote back and said yes and they were very pleased and they said oh, jolly good and then I wrote them another little letter and said there is one condition However, um, that is that I will tell them what I really think of the headmaster, and the, <laughs> they withdrew the invitation immediately. <laughs> so, yeah, how did you get your how did you get your first job oh, as a journalist? Oh, I, 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 I left school on the Friday morning, the other Friday, um, if, when it was, and um, on the Monday went to the Penarth Times, a little a little town outside Cardiff and said, can I have a job as a reporter? And he said, all right. Well, there was only one other reporter. Well, he couldn't really call him a reporter, I suppose. But so there were two of us. And yeah, I mean, it wasn't difficult getting a job on the Penarth Times, really. If you were prepared to work as I was for £1.17 shillings and sixpence a week, mm. yeah. which even then wasn't very much. <laughs> Plus, you had to pay your own bus fares if you went on a job, which you never had to do anyway. But so, so your f biggest first story was that you were the first reporter into Aberfan. Tell I us was. how that came about I and what was. that was like, because it's become I, so current again because I, of the crown. Well, because and of we'll the crown, come and up that, to that, date that, with that. that. That's right. I was. Um, I was then working for um, TWW, a little local television station mm -hmm. in Cardiff, and uh, on, on the particular uh, Friday morning, uh, I saw a thing on the ticker tape saying that there'd been a, um, a tip slide in uh, in the Merthyr Valley, uh, and in Aberfan. I knew it really well because I lived uh, in Merthyr, I'd been there, a reporter there for some years, uh, and I knew Aberfan as well, and I knew where the tip was, and I knew there'd been worries about the tip anyway, so I thought I'd take a drive up, we didn't know what had happened. And, um, and when I got there, it was the most horrible, but there are no words to describe it, it was, it was beyond heartbreaking. Um, it, the, 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 the tip had slid and it, it roared down the hillside um, at, 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 at great speed. People don't understand quite what happened, but it, the, the, the tip essentially dissolved from the middle and just slid and beneath it in the valley, in the, in the village, which was at the top of this hillside, um, it was primary school and mm -hmm. some houses and it just demolished the school. The children were in it, it was 9.15 in the morning and obviously the miners who were in the local colliery, the ones, the men who had built the tip, um, they heard. The, I mean, such a roar did it make as it came. And they rushed to the surface, of course. And when I got there, about an hour after it had happened, they were digging with their, quite literally, with their hands and shovels and picks um, for the children. the children in the school. And it was the most uh, hideous sight you, I mean, they were, they just come up from the college and their faces were black. I remember it in, in, in acute detail. And there were streaks of white down there. Mm -hmm. They were crying and sweating and, and digging. And, and, and every so often they would, uh, somebody would, would either blow a whistle or shout. And, and they would stop. Everybody would stop. And we'd all just stand very still while they listened because they thought they'd heard the sound of a child crying out. And uh, sometimes they did. I, I saw one little girl being carried out. Um, she was okay. She was alive. Uh, mostly they were dead. I mean, they just kept digging um, um, for two days and there were 116 dead children at the end of it. Um, but the thing that, the reason that that, that, that I was going to say reinforced, created perhaps my um, distrust yeah. of, of power and authority was because the men in that village, the, the miners, knew that that had been a dangerous place to build that tip. It was a relatively new tip. And they had warned the National Coal Board about it. And the Coal Board lied through their teeth. They, to this day, you will see reports, there's one in the 
telegraph there, you will see reports that say the tip slid because there'd been such heavy rain. But that is precisely what the miners had warned you the coal might board. Happen. And Lord Robins, who was the chairman of the coal board at the time, a lying bastard, he lied. They all lied, all of them, the whole, the whole coal board bosses, all of them lied. Um, and they might have got away with it, but, but the miners had written letters and they'd had copy, they, copies of those letters. And, and when, when the inquiry was finally held, they were found to be culpable. I mean, they'd been responsible for the death of... Uh, all those yeah. children, uh, and, 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 and had simply lied. So, you know. Extraordinary. And it, it was also now memorable because the, the Queen took eight days to get there, didn't she? She did, yeah. And that's been recreated in the Crown, which mm. you... It, it, it has. Um, I mean, obviously, one doesn't know the truth of it. The, the Crown has created a sequence, the programme has created a sequence in which um, Harold Wilson was the Prime Minister um, when they were beginning to get on the first day on that they were beginning to get an idea of the number of fatalities, um, went to see her and said, I think you should uh, go down. Do you have a van? And she said, no, well, no. The, the, the crown um, doesn't go to accidents. It goes to ho hospitals. Now, I don't know whether that's true or even remotely true, but the fact is she did not go down for eight days. And when she did go down, she said afterwards that um, it was the greatest mistake, the greatest regret uh, from of, of her, her reign of, of those years that she did not go down immediately but when she did go down she went to see some of the, the bereaved mothers obviously she walked out of the meeting and, and brushed away what obviously everybody thought was a tear there's then a sequence in the crown in which she says uh, it, it, she, she, uh, it was faked she did not have a tear coming out of her eyes and then right at the very end of the sequence of, 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 of the program I'm sorry if I'm spoiling this for you now. no 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 but, but at the very end, and you may not share my view if and when you see it, but, there, but there's a, a, a very long close-up of the Queen just looking into the middle distance, quite close-up, uh, her eyes fixed on him. And, and you know what's going to happen, and of course it does happen, and a single tear runs down. Her. And it made me very cross, mm. because you don't need to embellish grief of that sort. And, uh, so you took that anchor with authority into your years as being the lead presenter on today. I mean, well, I think every reporter, every, every interviewer, every reporter should, should be angry, maybe isn't the right word, but profoundly sceptical about Palmy. I mean, that is the whole point, isn't it, of, of doing what the people job. like me and what you've done for many, many years. We challenge, we do not trust authority or power. We, cliche, forgive me, we speak truth to power. We try to, and some, sometimes we're, we're, we're able to do that. So but if you compare back to, say, having Harold Wilson then, um, to having more modern prime ministers who seem to have more spin doctors, how much harder do you think it has got to get at the truth? Well, it, 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 it depends what you mean by the truth, of course. Well, I, I try to avoid the truth. I'd, I'd rather facts, because, just okay. because truth can be interpreted, if you see what I mean. Um, more, more difficult, of course, when, when, when um, Alistair Campbell came along, mm. he was different from, from any other, partly because he'd been... So he was different from, say, Bernard Ingham? Or I think he was, but, but Bernard Ingham was a civil servant. Alistair Campbell was a journalist. Mm -hmm. Alistair Campbell was, um, had this passionate, passionate loyalty to whoever he happened to be working for. You could argue a great character strength, great character weakness in that particular job. And you, you, you were not allowed, as you'll remember from those days, you were not allowed to harbor any doubts about Tony Blair when he became uh, Blair's man. And what he did in those years in Downing Street, I think, was immensely damaging in, in, in all sorts of ways. I mean, the, Go on. The, well, the story, I mean, I, look, I don't know whether, the, again, somebody told me this happened, and I believe him, he's a reputable bloke, he was sitting in the, in the newsroom, in, in, in the um, office, media office in the, uh, we didn't call it media then, did we? Maybe we were just doing it, in, uh, in the House of Commons, and, and Campbell, one of the reporters there, one of the lobby correspondents, and Campbell came along, and perched his ass on the desk and, and said, Gather, you got a bit in the paper at the weekend about, uh, about Tony, not very obliging. Hmm. And, she, and he said, mm, Yeah, I've got a big mortgage, have you? I mean, you know, silly story, possibly yeah. not true, but, you know, one, one, one can't help believing it. And he did, well, we know what he did during the, uh, uh, the Iraq yes. so called crisis. Um, and uh, I think he did, he did enormous damage to the whole process during the time that he was in power. And how quickly would they 
be on the phone with the BBC oh, be on the phone? How know? quickly? When were they off the phone? And certainly du during, during uh, an election campaign, um, always. I mean, they, they were never off the phone. They put enormous pressure on every single editor. Well, every, the, the editor of the Today programme, for instance, the editor of the World at One, uh, you know. You, you, you knew that if they picked up the phone, it would be Alistair Campbell or one of them. Sometimes, 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 very, very occasionally, it was quite useful. I remember Blair ringing me himself once before an interview, and it was about, um, and, and I don't know whether I feel guilty that I engaged him in conversation before the interview or not, but, but I did. Uh, he was, uh, I, I was doing an interview with um, somebody, senior figure from the... Uh, the pro uh, the Republican. Oh, I'm sorry, I thought you no, were no, waving at no. me. No, 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 she's telling us we're um, run out, but we and, I want to and, ask you one, at least one more question. And, 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 and Blair said, um, can I just tell you about something that you might find useful for this interview that you're going to do uh, with somebody from Sinn Féin? And, uh, and I agreed to chat to him. Maybe I shouldn't have done that. I don't know. Look, if the bigger question you're asking me is what should be the relationship between um, you and the politicians. Me and the politicians. I'm not after all these years, absolutely certain what it should be. My own view is that um, we should not have, people like me should not have a relationship with politicians. I've never done any whining and dining. I, uh, I could literally count on the fingers of one hand the number of times I've had lunch with a politician um, and, and, and then not a politician in power um, because uh, I don't want a relationship with them. I don't want to feel that I know them and they know me and I don't want to feel in any way that I'm beholden to them or they might be beholden to me. I like the thing to be as distant. Of course, you'll have a chat with them when, uh, when they come in and during the, meet them in the green room for five minutes, but that's it. I don't want any more than that. So I don't want a relationship with them. So do you wake up every morning thinking, I really want to get at him or her? get them in the 810 slot? Well, I, you probably don't know. I, I, I gather Nick Robinson hasn't revealed this yet, but I do send in questions. For the, um, <laughs> uh, yeah. You do? What have you sent in for tomorrow I, morning? I, I, I'm afraid I can't tell you that. <laughs> that, that that's between Nick and me. Okay. Uh, yeah. That's a joke, by the way, just in, just in case. <laughs> Nick is here. <laughs> uh, no, I don't, I don't miss it. But weirdly, I don't miss it. I do. Of course, I listen like everybody else. I imagine I think, bloody stupid, what a dumb thing. To and then think, actually, does it matter? No. Do really hang on now, I'm not saying that the day programme whew, doesn't Whoa. matter, doesn't matter, I'm not saying that, but, but um, I don't know how much effect a single interview with a single politician has on the today, on the today programme has on, on the, uh, the democratic process, I think we, we, can, we must have it, we cannot live without it, society can't, uh, democracy can't survive without it, but I'm not sure uh, whether we have quite as much influence as, as we think we have. I don't know. I or as maybe you used to have, and you would, could say the same for the Daily Mail, because so much is now online. We have, we, we have to take into account social media, don't yeah. we? And, 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 that, and that's the big worry. I mean, I think the BBC matters, matters enormously, but it's going to matter less and less. That's inevitable, isn't it? Kids that don't listen to uh, uh, the Today programme, by and large, and if they do, they might listen, if they do, if they do, a wee bit on their mobile or whatever, but mostly they'll be getting their information from somewhere else. Uh, but and that, that going back me. to sort of where we began with your total suspicion of authority, which I think lots of us share, do you think, the, where do we find authority nowadays? Do you think the BBC has it? Well, I'm not, I, I don't know what you mean by that. The, the, the question um, doesn't really apply, does it, to the BBC? Do what we, we have a, well, we, I think, that I, I prefer to rephrase it a little bit, and I would say, does the public trust the BBC? Um, I think that's, I don't want us to have authority. There is, there is an, it, the BBC is not a monolithic organization, and there is nobody in the BBC who says, this is going to be our take on this particular story or, or on this particular social change. You know, we are, uh, we, we, we do or we do not believe that there are more sexes than two. You know, men are men and women are women. I don't believe we should take a view on that. Um, I, so, so in that sense, um, we are not authority. We have no, we have no right, mm. let alone inclination. I hope to, uh, to 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 sound off on on matters of great social importance or especially political importance. Um, do they trust us? I think they probably. Do you? Well, sort of lukewarm, yes. But well, I'm, oh, all right. <laughs> how many of you? How many of you do not trust the BBC? Put your hand up, please. 
Right. All right, very few. There we are, Apple three. Open. I rest my case. Four. But anyway, Four. it's still. All right. All right. All right. Well, you the rest of you have never heard of the BTI in December. Thank you. Thank you for keeping us going for so many years, every morning over breakfast, and thank you for being <laughs> thank here. You.